Hi guys, how are you? For anyone new, I'm Jennifer and this is the happiest video where I get to talk about my favorite books that I read in 2019 and I do make the distinction between a best book and a favorite book so although a lot of these are, are excellent in my eyes, they're on this list because I love them. For those of you who are wondering, I read somewhere between 110 and 120 books in 2019. I think I, I don't keep track of everything on Goodreads anymore so I can't be 100% sure but Anyway, I'm, I'm mentioning 15 today, which is the most I've ever featured in an end of the year video. I think it, it was a good reading year, way better than 2018, up there with 2017 probably. And this will be my fourth yearly favorites video in a row, so I'll link the others below if you're curious and want to compare. Going in a rough order up to my absolute favorites, number 15 is The Evolution of Beauty by Richard O. Prume. After On the Origin of Species, Charles Darwin wrote a far less popular book called The Descent of Man, in which he argued that adaptive natural selection couldn't account for all evolution, that you had to factor in beauty as well, that sometimes animals and humans choose mates based on aesthetic qualities regardless of practicality, which sounds fairly intuitive when you say it, right? But Prune lays out how the field of evolutionary studies has hampered itself by clinging to this idea of clean adaptive natural selection and ignoring beauty. He then goes on to use his field of ornithology to provide examples of, of how beauty influences evolution and it is fascinating. I've never been interested in birds but Prune's energy is infectious and, and this is filled with the kind of facts you just want to share with other people. There's a particular chapter on duck sex that is insane and all the people in the room with me at the time were, were blessed with the facts <laughs> that I was learning from this. Um, and at the end, he, he gets into what all this could indicate about human mate choice. I can honestly say that I view all birds a little differently after reading this. Number 14 is Good Talk by Mira Jacob. It's the first of three memoirs on this list, but this one is a graphic memoir about Jacob's experiences as an Indian American woman discussing race with various people. These aren't conversations that she initiates for the most part, but they spring up at random moments while she's going about her life with her husband who's white, their child who's mixed race, her parents and in-laws, a teacher, friends of various races and backgrounds. And even though you only get glimpses of each of these people, you get such a sense that they're living full lives beyond these pages. Jacob brings an incredibly effective mix of humor and sympathy and confusion and curiosity to these sketches. And she's so good at capturing how larger national conversations affect our personal relationships and our senses of self. Number 13 is Lovely War by Julie Berry. And I know it's in the title, but lovely really is the best word for this book. I was so charmed by it. There's a frame story where Aphrodite is trying to convince a group of other Greek gods that love is a magical and a serious business and that by extension her role should be taken seriously. And to do this, she tells two World War I love stories. The Greek god sections have more of a YA sensibility to them, but when we get into Aphrodite's narration, it hits that sweet spot that, that works for both teens and adults. There's something sublime about Barry's characterization and her turns of phrase. Just thinking about certain parts of this book makes my heart feel a little warmer, so it's, it's easily my favorite YA title of 2018. Number 12 is Secondhand Time, The Last of the Soviets by Svetlana Alexeyevich, translated from Russian by Bela Shaevich. Alexeyevich interviewed various citizens of the former USSR from 1991 to 2012 about the collapse of their country, and then compiled their opinions and memories to form a sort of tapestry of the Soviet character, what defines people who were raised in this particular system, and how the introduction of capitalism has affected that character. This is a really violent, dark read in places, but no matter the topic, there's this background commentary on how we use stories to make sense of our countries, how nationalism and patriotism ask us to situate our life stories in our countries um, and then correspondingly what you do when the story you thought you would be telling is ruptured beyond recognition. Number 11 is Maggie Brown and Others by Peter Orner. The first two thirds of this is a collection of shorter than short stories and the last third is a novella. 
Although I really liked the novella, it's his short stories that left such an impression on me. They're mostly set in California, Chicago, and New England. Um, and Orner is effortlessly funny and perceptive. There's no hint of self-consciousness to this writing. He, he has such a quiet, organic flair. I don't feel like I'm describing this very well. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's harder to sell a collection of short stories to people, especially when there's not a main theme that you can latch onto to get people excited. But there is a cohesive tone here that's that's so affecting. And Borna reminded me that as a form, the short story can achieve something distinct that's just as significant as the longer forms. Number 10 is Know My Name by Chanel Miller. I read Miller's statement as Emily Doe back in 2016, the BuzzFeed article that went viral where she confronted the Stanford student who sexually assaulted her at a party. And this is subject matter that hits close to home for me. So I expected this memoir to be powerful, but if I'm being honest, I didn't expect it to be this good. Like so much of its power comes from from the grace and clarity of Miller's writing. Sexual assault is more a part of our discourse now than ever before, but more discussion doesn't necessarily mean better communication. And you No know, My Name helps bridge that, I think. It's both deeply personal and widely relevant. So whether you think you know very little or a lot about sexual assault, how it manifests in the media, in the court systems, in people's individual lives. This book is an eye-opener and a really moving one. Number nine is Milkman by Anna Burns. I described this earlier in the year as a novel I had to surrender to. It's a strange one and understandably polarizing. We're in the perspective of a young woman living in Belfast during the Troubles who, through no fault of her own, becomes the subject of scandal. And in both language and plot, the book embeds you in the paranoia and pettiness and scarily high stakes of this community. The writing felt counterintuitive when I was getting into the story. And then at a certain point, something clicked and it became completely intuitive. There's something primal about this book. It's both mythic and mundane at the same time, and I, I haven't really been able to stop thinking about it since I read it. Number eight is Giving Up the Ghost by Hilary Mantel. It's her only memoir, and I find it so interesting just how different it is from her historical fiction. I would say it's even more innovative. She takes the memoir form and stretches and compresses and twists it to suit her purposes. So Mantel grew up in a working class English family, and when she was seven had an uncanny experience, almost a, a presentiment of evil, that profoundly impacted her. It's an odd thing to describe, and Mantel herself finds it difficult to convey in words what happened, but from there she goes on to share fragments of her life, including her traumatic time with undiagnosed and mistreated endometriosis. If you've had bad hospital experiences, this part will do a number on you. But the skill with which she crafts these snippets of her life and and how this memoir doesn't feel like any other I've come across. I don't know, it's, it's not beholden to what people expect from a memoir. And so it ends up giving you what you didn't know to ask for. I, I think so highly of this book. Number seven is A Brightness Long Ago by Guy Gabriel Kay, by far my favorite fantasy title of the year. This is a new release, but like a few of his other books, takes place in a world modeled after the city-states of Renaissance Italy. The story is a standalone from the perspective of a politician looking back on a tumultuous period in his younger days. There are warring generals and political machinations, a love story, a version of the Palio, the horse race in Siena. That chapter is genuinely thrilling. This doesn't have any magic systems in it. It's more the, the alternate world end of the fantasy spectrum. But what really got me were the characters. You care so much about these characters. And Kay's wistful, elegant writing. I plan to dive into his backlist in 2020. Number six is Cleopatra, A Life by Stacey Schiff. Like in 2018, my favorite nonfiction title of 2019 is a biography. But this is quite the unconventional biography because the historical record offers very few verifiable facts about Cleopatra. Most of the people who wrote about her did so more than 100 years after her death, and they had their own agendas, and 
viewed her more as a symbol than as a woman or a ruler. So what Schiff does is she presents what we do know about Cleopatra and her batshit crazy family, and then makes educated guesses based on the cultures of Alexandria and Rome at the time. So we get these incredible portraits of these cities and all these details I never would have thought to consider, like the fact that it was rare for an Egyptian monarch to speak Egyptian, but Cleopatra could. Schiff presents everything in, in such a cogent and readable way. So if you're hesitant to try biographies, I'd recommend this one. Number five is Old Baggage by Alyssa Evans. This has almost everything I could ask for in a novel. It takes place in 1928 London, where two middle-aged suffragettes are each in their own ways trying to make a difference in women's lives. But people don't understand their urgency now that women have gained the right to vote. You got what you wanted, so what are you still yammering on about, is the attitude. And the novel examines so many things, fighting invisible battles, getting older and being treated as though you're less relevant, even if internally you feel much the same as, as you ever did, finding your moral code tested in unexpected ways, realizing that you're not appreciating the relationships in your life. The characters in here felt so real to me. Evans' writing is clean and witty and for the hours I spent reading this, I didn't want to be doing anything else. Number four is Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. I'm intimidated by experimental 20th century fiction, okay? I just am. I would so much rather crawl back to my 19th century comfort zone than risk feeling like an idiot, but I'm starting to think that I'm limiting myself because, yes, this is a book of many layers. For those of you who haven't read Mrs. Dalloway, it's mostly a stream of consciousness narrative following several groups of people throughout London over the course of a day, the day that Clarissa Dalloway is throwing a party. And there's no way on a first reading that I could fully appreciate all this symbolism and perspective shifts and societal commentary that are packed into this little book. But it's beautiful. I didn't expect it to be such a joy to read. Virginia Woolf's unconventional narrative choices aren't confounding literary tricks. They're, they're meant to convey what it feels like to be alive, and they do. That being said, I'm still a hoe for the 19th century, so number three is Barchester Towers by Anthony Trollope. God, I love Trollope. I can't believe it took me this long to, to really get into his books. Uh, this is the second in the Chronicles of Barchester series and centers on a cast of characters who live in a small English town and all of their interactions, both pleasant and aggravating for all involved. And probably my favorite aspect of it is how consciously Trollope plays with your sympathies. He will present a character as odious. And then a few chapters later, we'll deliberately put that character into a situation where you're supposed to root for them. This book is so fun and does that very Victorian thing of analyzing human nature in ways both comic and profound. Almost there, number two is In America by Susan Sontag, and it's almost ridiculous how many of my boxes this book checks. Sontag fashioned this after the real life story of a Polish actress who moved her family and friends to California to start a commune in the 1870s, and then made the improbable leap from Polish stardom to American and international stardom. The narrative explores Polish nationalism and identity versus early American national feeling. And it also looks at the, the tension inherent in being famous yourself for playing other people and what it does to the psyche to feel most real in the words of others and in the eyes of an audience. Honestly, Sontag as a novelist was kind of a revelation to me because <laughs> Yes, I expected this to be smart and incisive and conscious of the novel as a form, you know, playful with it, but I didn't expect it to be this immersive of a story. I didn't think I would necessarily care about these characters or be invested in the settings, and I was. Sontag brings so much care to these details and, and also a sense of wonder. I think muted wonder because she still is a bit of a cynical writer at heart, but um, I really lost myself in this book at the same time that I was amazed by all the, the things that she was doing paragraph by paragraph. And the number one spot for 2019 is Amy and Isabel by Elizabeth Strout. This is one of those novels where when you describe it, nothing sounds all that special. It's about a single mother raising her teenage daughter in a working class town in Maine. 
And the mother, Isabel, lives in a way that seems pathetic and claustrophobic and, and small to her daughter, Amy. But then Amy's life begins to uh, assume more color when she begins a relationship with one of her teachers. Like with most good books, it's the prose that elevates this. Strout's writing is like, ah, like I don't, I don't even have words for it. There's sounds, you know, the, the psychological acuity in here and the suppleness of her writing, how it can hold so many tangled emotions and messages in so few words. Like it's phenomenal. And I've said before that it baffles me that this was a debut. I mean, take me back to 1998 when apparently debuts weren't just barely digested autofiction, just um, <laughs> digressions aside, like truly, if you like simple but gorgeous literary fiction, I can't say enough about this book. Thank you for listening to me gush. Uh, please let me know what you think about any of these books. I would really, really love to hear from you. And I'll see you soon for another video.